I do want to both thank you for joining the session. Our focus on this session is really to talk about uh, both the theory to win immigrant justice in this moment. We are representing the We Are Home campaign, which is a national campaign fighting for immigrant justice and to ensure that we get wins in 2021 and in 2022. And we're super excited for you to join us today. I'm going to see if we've got folks that are adding their information on the chat to get a better sense. So welcome, Brianna, and uh, welcome, Daly. Uh, so continue to put your name and your pronouns and the communities that you represent in the chat. The other thing I do want to mention, too, is we would love to get a sense of who in this room, um, the issues that folks work on. So we'd really love for folks to share, uh, you know, the issues. If you've worked on the immigrant uh, justice space before, let us know so we can get a better sense of the diverse um, uh, diverse uh, work and diverse capacities that folks have had in interactions when it comes to immigrant rights and immigrant justice. So let us know if you have had experience in working in the immigrant justice movement before. So without further ado, I do want to go ahead and make sure that I introduce the guest speakers that are with us today. They'll get a chance to take a look at your information as you put it in the chat so we get a better sense of who is in the room. But we are really excited to meet with you all today. I do want to describe what we hope to have a conversation around, and it's really just a conversation some, with some really amazing movement leaders. We really want to have an opportunity to talk about you know, where we're at in the moment and in the movement for immigrant justice and really have an opportunity to talk about how we got to where we are at today, sort of what is happening today and sort of our years of uh, our learnings in the past years and what we're hoping to do in our vision for the future. So we really want to be able to share with you all sort of what we believe has been our theory to win and how we've grown over the years and really take an opportunity to talk about what is currently happening and what we're currently seeing in this under this administration and under this new leadership in Congress. And with that, we would also love to introduce now the panelists that are with us today. So I'm going to first go ahead and introduce Gabe Kashkuli. Gabe is a co-chair of We Are Home of our campaign and the political and legislative director for the United Farm Workers of America. He oversees the union political, legislative, and communications work that really helps build farm worker power. Gabe is no stranger to the movement. He's been in the movement for a very long time um, and has been a strong leader in making sure that every year we continue to grow our base, our support, and our momentum to fight for immigrant justice. Um, I want to lift, as both because I know Gabe has been a former teacher, as I am myself, um, just the, both the passion and support that he's not only given to this campaign, but to the movement for a long time and in building new leaders. Um, Gabe has worked with UFW for over 25 years throughout California, Arizona, New York, Washington, um, D.C., and Florida, and Washington State, D.C., and Florida. Um, and I just want to highlight some of amongst his uh, work. He's also been able to really uh, push for um, for great wins from equal overtime pay to heat illness protections for California workers um, to really uh, pushing forward collective bargaining laws for farm workers and winning national pest, um, pesticide protection and standards for farm workers. So I just want to lift that Giva has done a lot of great work and currently, again, is helping us at the campaign as one of our co-chairs, one of our five amazing co-chairs that are helping move forward a national campaign for immigrant justice. Um, the next, uh, so I'll give it a, a sec um, and for Give to introduce himself as well and share any other comments. But before I go there, I'm going to just mention the, the next panelist and then give both Give and Silky an opportunity to share a little bit more. Um, but our next panelist, too, is Silky um, saw and Silky is the uh, executive director of Detention Watch Network, another amazing member of our campaign. Um, Silky serves as a steering committee member of, well, of We Are Home and has been an active uh, leader in the immigrant rights, anti-war prison reform and racial justice movements for nearly a decade as an organizer, as a campaign strategist, as a journalist. Um, and Silky really has been leading uh, a lot of the work on what we'll describe in our campaign soon are executive strategy priorities and making sure that we are doing all we can and pushing our administration uh, to really exercise its executive authority to fight for our communities. And so Silky's got a long history of doing a lot of great work throughout different affiliates across the country have been moving work at a local level and a national level to fight for federal changes. So I want to both thank Silky and Guy for joining us today and give them an opportunity to say a few words before we jump right into our conversation about history in our movement and where we're at today to both give a glimpse of the, the power in the work, but really the power that we are continuing to build to win justice for our communities. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to you, Guy, and then Silky to say a few words in introduction. Sure. Thanks, Bridget, for that great introduction. And hello to everybody. It's so exciting to be with you here. What an amazing thing that Netroots has built, where we can all be meeting uh, virtually. Uh, we've been building infrastructure for these types of meetings now. And I think what, one of the things you're going to hear about is the ways our immigrant rights movement has been able to capture and organize and involve more and more people. And by involving more people, 
we know those are the, that's the basis for winning. So our invitation to each of you today is to, yeah, we're gonna, Silky and Patrice and Bridget and I are all gonna talk, but this is a, the way democracy works is by through participation. The way we build power is by doing it together. And I hope that we'll be able to do that together today. Thank you, Guy. I'm going to pass it over right before I pass it to you to Silky to say a few words. I'm going to introduce Patrice now that she joins us. So super excited to have you join us, Patrice. Um, for many of you who may not know, Patrice is also an amazing leader, not only in the immigrant justice movement, but in the We Are Home campaign. So uh, Patrice Lawrence serves as a co she serves as a steering committee member of the We Are Home campaign and currently has been recently appointed as the co-director and actually now executive director of Unjockey Black Network. Um, she leads uh, the work for those um, who, you know, I think both who are black and currently are formally undocumented in our, you know, growing and community and thriving community at this moment. I want to say for folks who may not have seen, uh, Patrice recently has been leading very powerful work on a lot of what we're seeing up front on the attacks on black immigrants and specifically on Haitian immigrants. Uh, her work has included a powerful work like getting DD um, deferred um, protections, or I should say, you know, getting ensuring protections for Liberians. Um, which came out through Undocument, uh, Undocu Black's great leadership, uh, working and fighting for TPS for many communities and for many, uh, both redesignation and designation of temporary protected status for many, fighting for DREAMers, for immigrant youth, fighting for diversity visas, decriminalization, and fighting against the attacks on our health uh, for immigrants across the country. Uh, Patrice is originally from Jamaica, and she's a graduate. Uh, uh, first, I should say, graduate here from Morgan F. From, um, from Jamaica, that is also first uh, here in her family to be to go to Holland University and I'm super excited that Patrice not only is an active leader um, in the We Are Home campaign but is actively on the forefront of the things that are happening in this moment um, and so excited to have Patrice join us and to share some of what is happening the great work that Injaki Black has been leading in this moment. So with that I'm going to pause and give both Silky an opportunity to say a few words and then Patrice. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here with everybody. This is actually my first time being at NetRoots Nation, so um, I am glad to be in this space with all of you. And I know there's been so many rich conversations already happening. I think um, I'm excited about this conversation largely because I think despite feeling occasionally like there's there's so much to tackle when it comes to immigration. We do actually have a lot of opportunity right now to change things. And I think We Are Home is a space where a lot of us who worked in different ways in the past and were trying to do a lot of different things said, we need to come together and we need to say, how many people can we protect? Can we protect as many people as possible in this country, both through advancing legalization and also through starting to really chip away at the enforcement machine that has targeted so many people, not just under Trump, but in the years past um, before that. And so I think this is a really, really important time to be pushing as much as possible because we do have a lot of opportunity for change and I'm excited to speak with you all about it today. So thank you. And Patrice, I'd love for you to share a few words before we get started into our conversation. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I am honored to be on this panel. I'm also a first time Netroots Nationer. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and um, and to be here virtually um, while we're still trying to stay safe. Um, yeah, I'm happy to dig in. I'm, I'm fighting for as many Black undocumented people um, and uh, and including those who are who are who are being um, abused uh, all over the country and in particular what we've seen the past few weeks um, Haitians and others at the border and I think it's really important that we advance justice at all levels of government. Thank you so much. I am super, um, I think, grateful for Netroots. I think not only uh, with the changes and making sure that this conversation could still happen under these COVID times. So thank you again, Netroots. Um, I want to sort of really kick off our conversation um, to really give folks an idea about where we're at. And so I really, you know, I hope to sort of ground us in a bit of the history um, of our movement. And so I would love to start that conversation about, like, if you can describe, you know, it's been a long time. It's been about, oh, you know, over 30 years since we've seen some really big gains in our immigrant justice movement. And I would love for us to sort of ground ourselves in the history of our movement because there's a lot that's happened over the past 30 years or since um, the last big, uh, you know, the big uh, wins for our communities around immigrant justice. And 
specifically, I think there's been a lot of growth of new leaders in, uh, that are in, in the Cohen organizations and that have the movement and, and the support for our movement has significantly grown. So I would love for Gabe, if you could share a bit about the history, about what has brought us um, to the moment that we're in today. And now there's a lot of stats, a lot of facts about why there's so much more support for uh, for getting immigrant justice done. Um, and we've seen it in many polls, but I think grounding us as to like how we got here and what's built and what sort of, um, you know, what we've seen over the past 30 years to get us here today. I'd love for you to start us there. Sure. So my name is Gabe Cash Cooley. I'm with the United Promo because as we mentioned, and we know as immigrants that we're not, that our immigration status isn't the only things that define us as people. Um, and this is a powerful uh, thing that brings us organizing together within We Are Home. It's a founding principle of, of the union that I'm a part of, the United Farm Workers Union. When the United Farm Workers was formed over 50 years ago now by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Larry Itliong, and other, do others, dozens of families, uh, the Magana family, the Urandai family, the Hernandez family, they, when they came together, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta sort of painted a vision for people and asked a set of questions. What is it that you could imagine that your world could be? And of course, some of them, like Caesar and Dolores, who were born in the United States. Others were immigrant. But they were all working as farm workers. They were all building off of a 200-year history in agriculture at that point in the United States, where agriculture was produced through, for hundreds of years through forced labor, enslaving people of African descent, uh, and directly, or through a set of immigrant labor. Um, and th the way the nation's immigration laws were deliberately, and other laws were deliberately designed to keep people in forced labor. So this goes back to excluding people from, Ch from China after they had helped build some of the fields. It literally forcibly repatriating Mexicans and Mexican Americans born in the United States uh, 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 to, to, to Mexico after their labor was no longer needed. It meant bringing Filipino men and not women um, from the Philippines to work in the United States in the field. So when this group of people got together to form what they audaciously called themselves initially the National Farm Worker Association, and it was 250 people in, in a, a made up of small towns, they made a list of 10 things that they wanted. And sure on the list was a union, also was on the list immigration laws, but there were another one, which was they wanted to once a week be able to hear somebody on the radio who sounded like them in the language that they spoke. So if you think about some of the things that we're up against today and you think about where we've come, you realize we can achieve in, and you understand why we say si se puede, that it can be done when we're organizing together. As Bridget referenced, the last time we've had major immigration reform was over 30 years ago in 1986. Uh, since then, there have been many attempts. Many attempts have received bipartisan support, have passed through the United States Senate or have passed through the House, both under Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. But it's never gone to uh, never gone to conclusion. And the two sets of biggest obstacles, first, um, has been there hasn't been, hadn't been a strong enough organized group to move us across to build the energy that it takes to pass anything through Congress. And second, and this is still present, there's been a virulent anti immigrant and racist and nativist component of American, the American population. In California, that surfaced in the mid 1990s as Proposition 187. Um, California politically looks a lot different today. At that time, it was controlled largely by Republicans who were specifically anti-immigrant. You can't get elected anymore in California if that's your position. Uh, Republican Party recently gathered and they realized there, there's fewer of them than there are people who don't declare their party in the state of California as a result. In the state of Arizona, uh, SB 1070 a decade ago, which has also started to transform the politics of the state of Arizona. What we're seeing today is not only politics being changed, I see Alma Young from our sister organization from Georgia is here, but we're seeing our immigrant communities organizing across the country in places like Georgia, which has then transformed the politics of a state like, uh, like Georgia. 
finally, the I think what the most powerful and my co um, guests on this speakers on this panel are uh, living proof of it. We see new organizations and new leaders led by immigrants, developed by conceptualized by immigrants, and 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 driving the broader conversation taking place. That's in our own organization, the United Farm Workers. We have a sister organization that's called the UFW Foundation, which focuses in on immigration services, and now is the second largest provider of immigration services in the country. Now, we're really proud of that, but one of the reasons we're the second largest is because there's not a lot of, there hadn't been a lot of people doing it over the last 20 years. But groups like Undocu Black Detention Watch Network didn't exist 30 years ago. You're gonna hear from Patrice and Silky in just a little bit, and you can see why I'm so excited, and so many of us are so excited, and why it means so, so central on why we believe we can have a breakthrough. So but that's a broad, quick history of our movement. Thank you so much, Keith. And I do want to iterate, I think that you've taken the moments that we've had, some of our hardest moments um, in our history, California, you said Prop 107, also Arizona's SB 1070, of which I was engaged in when I grew up in Arizona, and certainly what brought me into the movement. And I do think those moments of really difficult times have really helped us organize ourselves to fight back, to build power. And I think that's why you're seeing so many new leaders that in their states, like Patrice, like Silky, that are running organizations who've been been involved in hard moments in our history that have now brought and developed new leaders. So I'm gonna actually pass it to you to Patrice because and Talk you Black is one of the newer and really powerful organizations that is leading the immigrant rights movement. And if you can share a glimpse too of the history of, and also the history of how you all were founded, but also history in your perspective of our movement. Yeah, thanks, um, Bridget. So um, we, we came into being by the radical notion that, you know, as black undocumented folks, we should take charge of what was being talked about, what was being, what were the solutions, what were the issues, but also what are the joys, what are the hurt, what's the pain, what are the common threads and the ways for us to fortify ourselves with political education and the roots that we come from as black folks from all across the diaspora. Um, we've got folks who are from Africa, from the Caribbean, I myself from Jamaican, and folks even in between. Um, what we've learned along the way is that uh, conventional wisdom about what is possible is often wrong. We've been able to get uh, quite a few wins uh, that others thought weren't possible, right? Um, the LaRif, Liberian Refugee Immigration Fairness Act, we helped to just push it over the precipice uh, into actually delivering green cards for 10,000 Liberians all across this country who had been in limbo status for about 30 or so years. And I learned from the Black women who organized uh, before me and then with me when I came on, uh, when we told them that Congress didn't know what DED was, Deferred and First Departure, they were mortified. They were like, what do you mean? I've had this thing for 30 years. Oh, I'm going to show them. And they organized amongst themselves and showed up in Washington, D.C and showed up in their states and made calls and had their own press conferences and really showed us what it is like to have a united force behind something that's really good. And so we were able to pass that in 2019, right? Uh, one of the few uh, legalization bills to have been passed in the past 30 years. Um, other bills include uh, Harifa, uh, which was passed in 1998 for Haitians. So there have been many wins along the way um, and I think a lot can happen when we bind together. So I think this moment is also one of those possibilities. I think it's important to understand, um, you know, when he talks about labor as well, like that resonates for us, what it is like. And, and for us, we look at it through uh, a political education frame is that uh, labor and cheap labor has been what uh, United States and other large uh, countries are after. Right. And so when we are needed, they'll give us it all. And so there have been several programs over the years to make sure that there is labor to fuel the workforce. But when we are replaceable, they replace us and they move on and they don't give us something permanent which is why I'm so excited about this campaign that we're on to make sure that we are getting that permanence for people, that we are able to get that stability for people, uh, people who have worked for a very long time. And it's not unique to this country, right? Like in my own family, um, my mother lives in England. She migrated years ago to be part of the, um, to be part of the workforce as a teacher. 
right? And that's a unique relationship between many Caribbean islands and Britain because we were formerly colonized by them. And so it's just, it's it, it goes deeper. And if we zoom out sometimes from ourselves to understand the wider history of labor and of how people are used and then discarded. And I think what is different now is that we are standing up to say, you cannot discard us. You must also give us our full rights. We are not just workers. We are not just essential when you think that we are. We are full human beings that we deserve the right to have freedom, to travel, and, and to have access to all the things that make us full human beings. Thank you so much. I uh, want to just add, elevate, I think that, you know, when we say what makes sort of the history and the moment different, I think you sort of already started jumping into what makes this moment so different and what folks are now fighting for. Um, the, uh, folks directly impacted being the center of also leading the work, uh, which is what I think that's a big difference as, as we've seen over the years and the power that folks have done to win win uh, win things along the way as we're still fighting to have a really big win for our communities. Um, I think at that same token, I wanna, if, if Silky, you wanna touch light on any of the history because over the years, we've also seen many deportations. We've also seen a big change in what we see with more private, private prisons and just a, a switch. And so I don't know if you'd like to share anything in the history around that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, I'm Silky Shaw, the executive director of Detention Watch Network and Detention Watch Network is a national coalition of organizations and individuals, a huge range of groups, policy organizations, organizers, um, advocates, people who've been detained and their loved ones, um, people of faith who've come together, lawyers, people who are providing services to people in detention, who've come together to say, we don't believe that anybody should be incarcerated for their immigration status. Um, and. DWN actually was founded, next year will be our 25th anniversary. So we were founded in 1997, which was the year after the passage of the 1996 immigration laws, which when we think about different moments of nativist policies and other pushes in relationship to the criminal legal system and what we've seen, the expansion of mass incarceration and um, policing over the years, that was a really, really important point where actually a huge paradigm shift happened. So there was two bills that were passed under the Clinton administration in 1996 um, that basically expanded the scope of who could be detained, who could be deported, meant that a judge couldn't, de couldn't have their own discretion to determine who could be detained and deported um, based on a past criminal conviction, um, and also shifted the paradigm from resident versus non-resident to citizen versus non-citizen. So you had a lot of people who had green cards who are now also being targeted for detention and deportation. And a lot of our members, including somebody like Jean Montreville, who had a past conviction, he came here as a, a young person, had a drug conviction, served time for that drug conviction, conviction was released, lived his life, had a family, got married. And in after 9-11, when they started to put a lot of more money into the enforcement system, they started targeting a lot of these folks. And so then Gene was taken into custody and over many, many years of fighting his case and to not be deported, um, both in detention and on an ankle monitor. Um, during the Trump administration, he was retaliated against and was deported to Haiti and is still there today. Luckily, his case, he was, um, commuted, his case was commuted, he was pardoned, I think, um, by the Virginia governor. And so now we're trying to hope, hopefully he'll be able to come back into the country. But Gene is just one story of hundreds of thousands of people who've been detained and deported over, especially as we've seen since 1996, since after 9-11, since so much more money was funneled into the system. And I think when we think about the movement and that history, I mean, I think a lot of that was hidden and people didn't really see what was happening. I think DWN, Detention Watch Network, came together because a lot of people saw more and more detention happening. But during the Obama administration, because there was such a relationship between the criminal punishment, criminal legal system, and immigration enforcement, people started to understand actually how much 
that enforcement played such a role in their loved ones being disappeared, being deported, being taken away from them. And so that's where we started to see the anti-enforcement movement come together. And I think what's different about this sort of movement moment is that during that period of time and over the course of many, many years of fighting for comprehensive immigration reform, the, the options on the table were, let's get some good stuff with trading off some bad stuff. And I think we are home is a place where we've said, no, we don't want to do that. We actually want to protect as many people as possible, ensure as many people um, can stay here, can be with their loved ones, can work and do all the things that they want to do, have the legalization, have protection, and also have protection from enforcement from ICE. Um, and so I think that is a trajectory of the movement. I think moments like Prop 187, I think the 1996 laws, 9-11, SB 1070, and now what we're starting to see in Texas with Operation Lone Star and Abbott, like all those things catalyze these moments. Um, and, and what's been amazing about We Are Home is that we're actually trying to bring those conversations together and protect as many people as possible. Thank you so much, Silky. I think on that note, I do wanna now take the moment to say the We Are Home campaign is a campaign that launched in January. Its commitment is to make sure exactly what Silky just said, ensure that we are really thinking of both, what can we win um, on the legislative path and what can we win on our executive enforcement changes? Like what can we win so that there is wins for everyone and that we don't wanna leave empty handed, that we have an opportunity this year with new leadership to ensure that we are delivering on the promises that many folks have made. Many of our many of the folks that are represent We Are Home, that's represented by over 200 organizations across the country, are definitely folks who have been at the front and like the front line of many injustices and have been fighting back. But have also are the folks who have had many wins locally to push back some of these fights and these injustices, and most certainly have also engaged in the elections and have ensured that they're building the political power to ensure that the right folks are in office that will fight and champion the issues that we care deeply about. So I want to both raise that so folks know when we came into this campaign, I think leaders like Eve and leaders like Silky and Patrice, who were first at the foundation of kicking off this and launching the campaign in January, I'd love to both share what makes this campaign, maybe share a little bit more about the campaign. Um, happy to do so, but I think you as leaders who are part of our leadership in the campaign, to share a little bit more about the campaign and what makes this moment different for this campaign and what we hope to aspire and win. And I'll pass it and open the mic there if Eve or Patrice our Silky would like to start. I'll start. <laughs> I think the intersections and, um, you know, it's, it's really important and we've really seen the power of being able to raise up both what is happening with enforcement at the same time what is happening with legalization. Um, and that has really uh, rung the bell. Now, it is a very hard fight. And I'll admit that some weeks it is incredibly difficult as we see the hypocrisy of the government, right? In the same week that they will say they're defending migrants, they're defending immigrants, they love everyone, is the same week that then they'll handle deportations and are, are deporting mass people. And we saw the violence um, that has been happening. Uh, but I think that being able to even have a united front uh, echoing that alarm, We Are Home was uh, the first, I believe, to actually sound the alarm when the most recent mass deportations of Haitians and other Black migrants happened three weeks ago. So before it got into the media, we actually started with the first deportation and making sure that it had eyes all around. That's really, really important. You know, in this age, apparently you need to see to believe. And though sometimes that is frustrating for me, uh, hoping that people would at least just hear our stories and believe what we're seeing, um, we are seeing that having more people with us in the fight is really important and to show that you can't do for one what you're not doing for the other. So I think that's uh, that's what makes this this campaign truly unique. I can build on that. Um, our movement, as we brought in, as more people have organized and built more organizations and more voices have come in, we've gotten smarter, we've gotten stronger, because when we organize, when we add more voices, you get stronger, and that's exactly what's happened in our movement. We've won, we've won major things uh, in states and localities um, and nationally. Patrice mentioned uh, citizenship for 10,000 people who were originally from Liberia. 
um, in the uh, for farm workers. Again, immigration laws are, and race-based laws are directly connected to exploitation. You know, the farm workers, because uh, from, from after uh, enslaving uh, Africans and those of African descent, we then went to a set of immigration laws that explicitly excluded farm workers from our federal labor laws, from overtime pay, from minimum wage, ultimately from pesticide protections. And members of Congress in the 1930s were explicit about it. They did. They said they did not want white people and black people to have the same rights in the 1930s. It's taken decades, but we've now had several breakthrough wins. In the state of California, farm workers now have equal overtime pay. Uh, just this earlier this year, the state of Washington followed suit. Colorado is in a conflict net right now as we speak. The state of New York added union organizing rights for farm workers, and farm workers just the other day formed the first successful union in the state of New York. Um, I can, there's over, uh, there's close to a dozen states now where immigrants, regardless of immigration status, can get driver's licenses. So those sets of victories, and there are many others, have helped build strength, they've helped build confidence, they've helped acknowledge the women and men who live in our country uh, and to be their fullest selves. Um, and today, what that means is not only are we smarter, but we have more capacity. We're able to organize in Georgia, in Arizona, places we never didn't think about being able to have significant impact 20 years ago. Um, finally, what that has meant, because we've contributed to that set of work, the politics of our country has changed. Uh, our movement has been very central to helping change who is in Congress, who's elected. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris had several breakthroughs, but among them, daughter of immigrants. Um, and because of that, and because who's in charge, for the last, we've never had this set where we have a president of the United States and a vice president who on day one made a commitment and campaigned on changing our immigration laws for the better. We have a House majority which has passed bills in the early part for farm workers, DREAMers, and uh, TPS, Temporary Protective Status Recipients. And we have a United States Senate leadership that says they're doing everything they can to change the immigration laws. Now, that isn't, none of that's been easy. Patrice has alluded to there is conflict holding people. But even under Donald Trump, 8 million immigrants were declared essential and be parting of essential workers. And the We Are Home campaign has formed to say we cannot both be essential and deportable, that this must finally change. The final thing that's changed is, and I, I see my colleague Jocelyn Sherman, who is an early pioneer of Netroots Nation. I didn't know about that nation years ago, so she's an early, uh, uh, an early migrant. Um, but all of you who are here at Netroots Nation, you can join in. Those of you who have not been involved, you can join in. And that's what will make this moment different than the moments before. And I hope that you will choose to do so, to join in both with We Are Home and with our organizations individually where you feel you can make the biggest difference. Thank you so much, Keith. And I do, I think what you described is like, like exactly right. We are, this is the first time where we have all chambers and from day one and even prior of this administration came out strong on saying things must get done. And now sort of as I, I'm gonna move us to a question about like, the accountability here on, on the administration, but I do want to add, I think that is, I want to be clear that like we are the most popular we have in terms of the issue that majority of voters support and the majority of, of populations here in communities understand. I think with DACA and DACA being in the courts, I think a non-knowledgement about immigrant youth and the impact that temporary programs can have on folks and why we've seen the program Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, um, being at risk under the Trump administration and it going through the courts now um, and the changes that we're seeing in the program, how critical it is that we pass something because no one should ever live court date to court date and be in limbo of unsure what's going to happen to them. Um, and at the same time have given up their information and really be fearful about what it means to them. Um, so I just want to both acknowledge the what makes this moment different and what this campaign's dedication is, is like I you you said all the, the real the real realities. We are in a moment of having a leadership in many of the positions to make change happen. And that we also have the support behind us of so many folks who understand more about what immigrant justice is and who are immigrants in our in our community. Um, that it definitely, as this campaign, 
has committed to. We're not going to, uh, we're going to reject that we just have to focus on one, you know, one legislative path only or just like one thing and not not take a look at a bigger picture. And this campaign said, we're really going to make sure that we look and embrace any and multiple opportunities to win a legislative vehicle and also ensure that we are focusing on changes that the administration can make so that we are really thinking about the many multiple ways that we can have wins for our community. And on that note, I'm going to switch over the conversation and really ask the question about how this administration has kept on their promises of changing our immigration system since the Trump administration. I know the administration, you know, has definitely recently issued a new um, the Department of Homeland Security enforcement memo. And so just like questions about what does it mean when it comes to delivering on its promises, especially with the things that Patrice mentioned earlier about the many deportations. Um, I think maybe kicking this over to you, Silky, to have us share a little bit more glimpse about what we're seeing in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think there's no way to talk about this as I think a lot for a lot of people in many ways, because Trump's not in office, the assumption is that things are better. And the truth is, these systems have been built up, up and up for so many years that actually the process of dismantling them is going to be a lot of work. And, um, you know, I think out of the gate, so I think, you know, I, I will say that there's no question that at least on the enforcement side, um, it's it's been a challenge because it's there's been some good, there's been some bad. Um, and I think some of that is actually related to how we've gotten to this point where ICE and CB, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Customs and Borders Protect, Border, Border Protection are funded at astronomical levels and have a lot of resources and have been sort of built up, especially after four years of Trump in this situation um, and even prior to that, but especially now this sort of question of how do you implement these policies and how do you move forward to make a system that's much more humane, that's gonna protect people um, and whether these are the systems that can actually do that. And I think some of us really question if they are, um, but in terms of Biden, I think on, you know, day one was actually quite remarkable in that he came out of the gate, like he was saying, he came out of the gate supporting citizenship. He also came out of the gate supporting a moratorium on deportation, saying we actually are going to protect people during this period of time where we're trying to push for citizenship. Um, but unfortunately, we're also in this situation where we have a lot of conservative judges who are ruling against some of these policies. Um, and, and so there's this, this challenge with the administration where they don't want to get sued on certain policies, but then aren't taking the bold steps that they actually can. And what anything that Trump taught us is that actually there's a lot of discretion when it comes to immigration at the federal level, and they can do a lot to not put people in the pipeline for deportation, to not expand detention centers. And so... What we've seen um, are some moments where we have had some wins. Detention Watch Network kind of came out of the gate and said, we want to see some detention centers closed down. And in May, they made the announcement that they were going to end contracts at two really, really horrible jails, including, including the Irwin Detention Center in Georgia, um, which was on the, our list of facilities to shut down that um, had the story that maybe some of y'all heard about forced hysterectomies happening there last year. Um, and they also talked about there being an overuse of detention and wanting to start performing that system. Additionally, and since then we haven't seen much on that front and we hope to see more there. Um, and they've also, you know, started to expand some detention centers um, or, you know, include new contracts. So it remains to be seen what we're gonna see those shifts, but we, um, we know that they do have concerns about the system um, and we're trying to push them to address it and had a big day of action a few weeks ago to try to really push the administration on that. Additionally, as Bridget mentioned, there was an interior enforcement priorities memo. So this is sort of how ICE decides who is a priority to target for detention and deportation. And a new memo came out. There's been a few iterations of it during this administration. It was something that actually was sort of new in the Obama administration, a, a really good strategy strategy to push and say, how can we get, how hold ICE accountable, show what they're doing because they're prioritizing everybody essentially. Um, I think one of the challenges about the memo right now is sort of what I was saying earlier, which is after four years of Trump, you have an agency that's that much more emboldened and 
really wants to target immigrants. And that's why it's so important that the We Are Home campaign exists to say, actually, one, people need to be protected through getting legalization, getting citizenship, being here um, and not being targeted for deportation. And we need to reduce these agencies. We need to move away from having a mass detention system. We need to stop collaboration with police because the only way we're going to be able to protect as many people as possible is if we reduce the enforcement infrastructure. And so that's a lot of the push that we have right now. Um, and I think Biden, to some degree, is trying to make some changes, some memos, some small moves, nothing quite bold enough yet to have the impact that we want to see. Um, but, you know, we're we're in year one. We have a lot more to go. And I think um, if we keep that pressure and I think I think one of the things about a few weeks ago when we saw what was happening at the border in Del Rio to the Haitian migrants who were there, um, you know, it's one thing for the administration to be saying one thing and something else to be happening on the ground. And those are our moments where we really need to say more needs to happen. And we need to both see a push in Congress and a push from the administration to protect as many people as possible. Thank you, Selkie. I don't know if Patrice, do you want to add anything to that question too, especially with what's been happening recently? Um, this topic irritates me and makes me really angry um, for many reasons. One is that, um, you know, and, and Silky mentioned like the 1996 laws that was put under by, um, by, by, by a Democrat, right? And had large support. And actually, if you go back and watch any of the videos from when IRIRA and EDPA, I don't remember what they stand for, somebody else do it for me. Um, and also the welfare laws, but that group of laws in 1996, and you listen to Bill Clinton's speech, you cannot tell the difference between Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. It sounds identical, right? It was a truly horrible vote. And the legacy of that is what gave us mandatory detention, is what gave us um, three and 10 year bars, is what gave us a lot of what we are seeking to peel back. And so I think that digging at the root would be really helpful and just uprooting those laws altogether and changing the INA um, is what is really important to get done. And, you know, we see a disparity and, and we've said it for a long time, people saw it with their eyes. There's a dis with how migrants are, treated, right? Even very popular programs that we have fought and others have fought to get rid of, like MPP, Remain in Mexico, the numbers there of Black migrants that actually will benefit from the repeal are not large. And that's not because migrants were not trying to come under Trump. It was because of the anti-Blackness that exists under ICE and CBP that they were not allowed to cross the border in the first place. So there's nowhere for you to remain if they never let you cross in the first place, right? Um, and, you know, it's just, it's a larger issue and a political issue of the history and the legacy of this country and the West in general with, 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 with migrants and with Black people. And I spoke earlier about labor and just the abuse that they're allowed to get away with and the preference of you know, who does it make sense for them to destabilize? And in this moment, it makes sense for them to destabilize a lot of our Caribbean countries, right? It makes sense for them to meddle where they can. And that's a longer conversation that ends up getting into politics. But what I'm clear on is that the choice to, uh, to engage war on Black migrants, on migrants at the border is a choice. They don't have to listen to CDC and they don't have to enact Title 42 and they don't have to do any of the enforcement that are currently happening within the country. It is a choice. And the choice that instead they could make is to offer care and compassion to everyone who is seeking protection and to make sure that they're having it. We have so many tools in our toolbox. And I just you know, think that we have to fight for that while at the same time calling them out on their double standards and calling them out on the tools that they are refusing to use and this idea that their hands are tied that is false. Um, and I think that that actually is like a recurring theme all around for the problems that they have created for migration. Migration can truly be a beautiful thing. 
It can be a welcoming thing and we can be well resourced when we seek to migrate to a country. And it can be an autonomous thing where you yourself are able to do it for you. Um, and the everyone is guilty in this. Um, all the systems that be are guilty in why we have the situation that we have now. And Patrice, you just like named it of like, we, there is alternatives of what can be done and how it can be done well and what can be beautiful because immigrants are, uh, migration is beautiful. Immigrants have done a lot of making this country and making small communities thrive. Um, and helping rebuild communities, and especially we've seen it in this pandemic, a reminder of how critical immigrants um, play in the United States and the role that they've had for many years. So I name that to say, I think as we think about, or the question I want to ask is sort of in this moment, and I think, you know, there, everyone threw out a lot of acronyms that maybe not everybody knows, but I think the acronyms to say, I think that there is a lot of changes we can make both on the executive side and on the legislative front, so much is currently moving. And I think I wanna bring light to sort of what we believe as we are home um, and with your leadership, what we believe are real opportunities um, to obtain a win for immigrant justice this year. So I'd love to maybe start with, um, uh, you know, start with you, Give. I think there's a lot that's happening on the legislative front. I'd love for you to give perspective of what we're seeing and why we think there is a possible win for a big one for us this year. And then I'll pass it over to you, Silky and Patrice, to kind of share. We've You shared a little. We've seen some wins in the administration. What are the changes we want to see that could really make us remind folks that there is an opportunity, there is a way forward, and that I think uh, that we want to, that we are currently pushing for because we know that it is possible. So I'll kick it to you, Guy, first. Yeah. So since the beginning of human history, people have moved. Uh, when we talk about immigration, sometimes we sort of lose that, that pe people move. Uh, what we're seeking is legislation that would honor the women and men and their communities and their families, uh, both who feed the country as farm workers, uh, but also more broadly, uh, all the different ways that immigrants contribute in their communities and help grow and strengthen our American dream um, to allow people to be in the United States uh, with legal status, uh, to be able to go back and forth between here and their home country, to ultimately, uh, if they've uh, earned that right to be able to apply for legal permanent residence, and then ultimately, should they choose to be able to apply and earn U.S. citizenship. Those are the set of laws that we expect and hope uh, and think would truly honor the women and men who contribute in, in our communities. We've in, uh, been successful passing through the House of Representatives bills that would do that for farm workers, dreamers, young immigrants and those with uh, TPS, with temporary protected status. Um, we also have bills that introduced that would cover millions more people here in the United States. So far uh, in, in the House, we will get bipartisan support for those, those concepts, but in the Senate, we have not been able to uh, in, in a substantial way. Uh, so what we've asked because of the American public overwhelmingly supports these changes, We've asked the congressional leadership in both the House and the Senate to pass as part of our budget bill. And in the coming weeks, we're hopeful um, that Congress will do just that as we work to, uh, uh, to give people a way to be part of this country uh, in a legal way, uh, in addition to the country that they've already made their home. Uh, so those are the big sets of things that we're hoping to do. These next couple of weeks are really important. Uh, and we're going to ask each of you to weigh in with your member uh, of Congress, both your member of the House and your senators, so that they do just that when they have the chance. Thank you, Gabe. And I'll also let folks know, I'll send it in the chat, um, ways that we are like verbally tell you where you can find more information and get engaged. But I'm gonna now pass it over to Patrice and Silky to sort of uh, share with us about the ways forward and opportunities, either to add what Gabe just shared, or also to share sort of on the enforcement side that we do see there's real possibilities for some wins. I can I, I can start if that's okay. I, I mean, I guess the the thing is one of the most amazing pieces of organizing that's happened around enforcement is really at the state and local level. So in, in a lot of ways, this campaign is trying to bring some like federal demands. And, I, and we saw this previously in efforts um, like the Not One More campaign years ago that really was pushing to stop deportations and, and also impacted um, 
the ability for some people to stay here legally as well. And so I think there are, is a clear connection there. And what we're seeing at the lo local level is a lot of efforts to shut down detention centers and some that have been really, really successful. Um, so both pushing counties to end contracts um, with ICE and then also state legislatures. So we've seen California, Washington State, Oregon, Illinois, New Jersey, Maryland, all pass bills recently to curb detention. Um, one of the things that we really pushed for, um, you know, so much of the detention system is outsourced to either counties or to private prisons. And Biden did come out and say he was gonna phase out private prisons from the Department of Justice, but he didn't extend that executive order to the Department of Homeland Security. And so that's actually a really important push right now and, and to, to get him to say, actually, we're gonna overall remove the use of private prisons and, and that could actually really have a dent in the detention system. Um, and the reason why detention is such an important piece of this, not only is it incredibly inhumane, sometimes deadly, a really harsh system for anybody to ever be in, but it also really facilitates deportation. So their ability to have detention centers, to have ICE deportation flights, all of that is stuff that facilitates their ability to do mass deportation. So we really wanted to reduce those systems. And I think there's still opportunities to win on that. And in, in fact, so much of the movement is still really engaged on these issues. And I, there is absolutely no question the broader conversation about policing and prisons in our society and that relationship to immigration enforcement has opened up space for us, especially in this sort of racial equity bucket that Biden has been talking about. And so we're gonna t continue for those pushes to make sure we we start really chipping away at the enforcement system. And I, I do think we still have a lot of um, opportunity to do that and, and to sort of expose the ways that it's not happening right now. And we wanna see something bold. Thank you, Silky. And watching time, I want to get, make sure to give an opportunity for to open it up. I think what you both shared um, is where we see opportunities of real hope to win protection for many folks. Again, protection from deportations, where we can do that protection in this moment for a path to have dignity and respect and security um, for many families and many individuals in our country. Um, so I want to open it up to see if there's any questions the folks have in the chat about what we believe is our theory to win um, and how folks can get engaged with We Are Home. So I'll open it up to see if there's any questions. Um, and at that same token, then I will also give an opportunity later for all of our panelists to sort of give some closing remarks about um, ways that folks can engage and um, sort of our last call to actions in this moment. I'll see if any questions come in the chat. One question I think that I'll make sure we ask is if folks can share um, sort of a little bit about what is, you know, I think the opportunities of how many, um, I guess, what is the window of opportunity that we're seeing on the legislative side, Give, And then I think uh, a question of opportunity, it sounds like on the executive side, the window is maybe different there, but I think if you can share a window of opportunity. I think in the coming weeks, it's really important uh, right now. Um, the, we're not expecting everyone to be a ex expert in legislative process, but in the coming weeks, there will be a vote likely that Republicans will all choose to vote. No, it's part of a bigger budget bill. And we believe that we will have some significant advances for immigrant communities. It's really important that every Democrat votes yes in the United States Senate and, and in the house of representatives. And so for each of you, um, wherever you live, to call your member of Congress uh to engage with your member of congress specifically on supporting immigration as part of the budget reconciliation process that would be really fantastic for everybody who eats you rely on an immigrant farm worker so we'd ask a, a small favor in return uh, a phone call an email even better involved with we are home and get and become more active And thank you. And Dieli, if you want to share, I think I'm going to pass it also the next question of like, what are opportunities of engagement, which Steve, you just shared. Uh, we can definitely add in here the We Are Homes website, where if you are interested in signing a petition to show your support and get emails to members of Congress, you can do that. If you'd like to use our phone number and be able to call and call your members, if you're not sure how to do that or what to say, there's a script and there's resources to help you. So we'll add that to the chat. 
Um, but definitely would love to ask, I think there's questions around what are any upcoming actions or activities that folks may be able to engage with, whether that's virtually or in person. Um, so would love to open that up. Maybe I know Patrice, there's some upcoming events even this week. Yep, and I was able to find only the links for one of them. Uh, but we have a, a event in DC on Tuesday, on Wednesday, October 13th. Um, I think we'll put it in the chat there uh, with CUSP groups, which are other groups, uh, Haitian Bridge Alliance, Andaki Black, NAC, um, African Communities Together, and Adhakar, um, who have a lot of CPS uh, groups who will be um, having an action in DC, a press conference, as well as um, something further up in DC. So you don't want to miss it. Um, please come out in your numbers, and you can also help out with um, with making sure that you uplift our socials. Um, I think definitely following all of us is a really big thing. And thinking about like how uh, the agenda matters to you in terms of immigration, migration, other pieces of Build Back Better, I think all support is important, including support for the whole because we don't live single issue lives. So all of this matters to us. Thank you. And I'll say also lift. I know that there is, in addition to the great action on the 13th, folks can expect to see that this week there's a theme week coming up around elevating the importance of temporary protective status, not only to ensure that those who are TPS holders also have and are included inside of them, you know, our wins that we hope to see under reconciliation and the Build Back Better agenda, but also the reality that there is also redesignation that can be happening to many TPS or to many countries to designate T at uh, TPS right now and provide. Um, a re critical relief and protection. And so I'm naming that this week will be a TPS week of action. The following week is a Latino week of action. Um, but there's definitely ways that folks can engage. There is, um, uh, in addition, there is going to be some actions that you're going to start to see across the country because it is recess for our congressional members next week that if you look on the We Are Home website, you'll get to see a series of different actions that folks are taking at the local level. So if you'd like to engage, there'll also be a directory of many of the partner organizations if you're interested in engaging more deeply. Um, I'm going to pause to see there, if, Silky, if there's anything you want to add there too. We, well, we just had a, one of our big days of action a couple of weeks ago where we had 25 actions across the country calling for an end, a stopping to the deportations and the detentions that are happening right now. Um, I think in the next few weeks, um, we'll probably share out some information about a lot of our members um, take part in vigils and other actions around Dia de los Muertos when you know people are honoring those who've died in detention, but also um, in our communities or those who've been deported um, back to not great conditions. And so I think um, we, you know, that might be something that's coming up, but I guess I would just encourage folks, um, like Bridget said, to like follow us. There's always actions to take depending on where you are. There's probably a detention center nearby. There's probably a group that we're working with there who's supporting the people who are there trying to either push for closure of that facility or getting folks released, especially because COVID continues to spread inside detention centers. Um, so I think that's the best way to get involved and engage as well. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Silky. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to close this out by both thanking everybody who joined us today. As you know, I think we have come a long way. I think our movement is stronger. Many of our leaders and even leaders that are in Congress, our folks that are like a representative SBI or you name it, there's many leaders now, even representative um, Jayapal, who are actually folks who've come from our leadership, Senator Padilla, folks who've actually been embedded in the immigrant rights movement for a very long time, um, and folks that now are seeing changes. We're seeing folks fighting for us and with us and, and collectively getting both local wins and then having more support at the federal level. And so I really, we are asked to sort of thank you, Netroots, for giving us the opportunity to talk about you know, about immigrant justice, the importance of our progressive movement, who has gotten us to also get as far as we have. And want to thank everybody for your continued commitment and invite you all to join us. If you're not active with We Are Home or not active in the immigrant justice movement, it's an invitation to join us and also an invitation to help us get and achieve the, the wins that we see that are in front of us in the real opportunities. So with that, I want to close us out and thank everyone and thank of all our speakers. Thank you, Give. Thank you, Patrice. And thank you, Silky, for joining us today. And thank you again, Netroots. Bye, everybody.